This is Tracer Talks, conversations with top industry experts on trending topics for brands and digital risk protection, featuring your host, Tracer CEO, Rick Farnell. Okay, welcome everyone to episode five, Brand Protection with AI. Today will be about fighting cybercrime in the luxury goods market. Today we are joined by Angelo Mazza. Angelo, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Rick. Really is a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Angelo, just uh, why don't we get things rolling? Tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your role at Gibney, Anthony and Flaherty. Well, I've been at Gibney now a really long time. Uh, we'll call it 30 plus years. And I have been involved in the anti-counterfeiting arena for most of that time. And as the world has changed, so has what I do in terms of the online enforcement and working more with customs to uh, protect the borders. So it, it's it's an evolving role, but one that is deeply immersed in dealing with counterfeits at all levels. So certainly you've seen a lot of change over over uh, a period of time there. And tell us a little bit, like, what, what are your thoughts on the brand protection market today? You know, it's interesting because there are a lot, there's a lot of potential for enforcement, but it's also offset by how scary it is with counterfeits, how good they're getting, the changes in attitudes that people have. AI is now in the back of every conversation we're having about brand protection so it it it's a hopeful time, but it's also a scary time. Yeah, and and diving into kind of the luxury goods market, there are some really interesting trends. I love your thoughts on this. We're actually seeing it's cool to buy counterfeit products like like that as a concept is so foreign. But yeah, talk a little bit about that and and how that's kind of changing the dynamic uh, as we look for counterfeiters out there. It, it suddenly became cool. It, it's the dupe culture where uh, people want to have the best counterfeits and they, they get promoted on social media. There are ways in which uh, there's a, a wink and a nod that it looks like we're not selling counterfeits, but we are selling counterfeits. We're promoting them. People, in fact, it was an article in the New York Times a couple of years ago, maybe, where they talked about the journalist search for the perfect dupe. Oh, right. Yeah, her yeah. online searching, her, her actually taking trips to see the factories where the goods were being made. And I think that shows um, a shift in the way in which people view counterfeits, as opposed to saying, oh, it's harmful, it's bad. There are um, slave labor practices involved, human trafficking, all those things. They kind of look at it, oh, no, it's just, it's a dupe. It's a copy. We're just doing, we're not worried about any of the background. It gets pushed to the side and all they're focused on is the counterfeit product. Now, I guess for, for those of us consumers that really want authenticity in the brands that we're buying, what are, you, you, you see a lot, right? You see a lot of stuff digitally. You see a lot of things that happen and, and certainly over the years uh, to our consumers that are out there. What are some tips for them to maybe better recognize that they're not dealing with the actual brand itself, the luxury brand itself? You know, Rick, if, if you ask this question five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the answer would be completely different each time. And I think it goes to the evolution of the product, the way it's sold. Nowadays, a consumer really has to be careful. First and foremost, if it's too good to be true, in all likelihood, you're looking at a counterfeit. Look at the source for the goods. Try to determine where they're coming from. If you've got a product that is known for being made in a European country, well, then if you're able to discern that this stuff is being shipped in from China, that's another red flag. Take a look at the way in which the item is promoted, the, the language that is used. Of course, again, AI is in the mix too, because just on LinkedIn, you can have all your posts rewritten by AI. And I'm sure that the counterfeiters can use AI to write a better description of their products. So it, it, you almost have to be your own sleuth, right? Everyone's got to be a little bit of Sherlock Holmes to try to figure out um, more about the product. Just don't take it on face value. 
it's a good point. So you you talk a little bit about AI there. Let's let's dive into that um, with the entire planet talking about generative AI and AI. How do you feel that it's changing the game, the luxury goods market, maybe from both sides, right? So you just talked a little bit about how the bad actors that are out there can utilize this. T- talk a little bit about kind of, uh, you know, three your thoughts. Well, I think AI, again, going back to, to how we started this, there's a lot of promise out there. There are opportunities to utilize AI in, in searching, there's uh, a way to use AI. I, I noted, I saw um, an article on LinkedIn about one of the, the pharma protection uh, groups is using AI to distinguish between genuine and counterfeit pills by using photography and the power of AI. But counterfeiters are always better at exploiting new technology. Uh, back when uh, Pinterest was a thing, more of a thing, the counterfeiters figured out how to use it to sell products. Instagram, same thing. They, they didn't need Facebook Marketplace to be able to sell product. They knew the power of the technology and harnessed it to be able to push out counterfeit goods. So I think that um, in terms of what, what is out there, they're going to be using AI to make a better product, to sell it better, and to deliver it in better ways to the consumers who are ordering it. That's a good point. Um, you know, I think from from our side, certainly at, at Tracer, uh, as, as you know, as the you know partners, we're trying to use more sophisticated techniques uh, in order to keep up with the scale and speed that the bad guys can perform and. Uh, you know, you mentioned a little bit about kind of the image detection. So computer vision is something we put a, a significant investment on to really detect minor changes in, you know, images, logos, patterns, um, all kinds of um, even even trade dress uh, packaging. Uh, there, there's there's such subtleties that. If you do have the capabilities, you can pick up to get, you know, better, better velocity on detecting things earlier in the process, therefore having a chance to take it down before it does have a chance to get to, uh, to end consumers. You know, and, and other trends that we're seeing, certainly, I think a year and a half ago, NFTs were, were the craze. If you remember a couple of years, maybe a couple of inches ago, almost all the sessions were about that. And, and like any transformative technology, similar to the internet and cloud and, and mobile apps and, and things like that, uh, non-fungible tokens will be a way of the future. It's going to impact cryptocurrencies probably here to stay in some capacity. So certainly what we're trying to do is get ahead of a lot of these um, you know, capabilities, tips, tricks, trends that are out there in order to better support our, our partners. So, um, yeah, we call it using AI for good uh, as, a, as a general. Do you feel it's, it's more of an arms race sometimes in terms of when you're dealing with what the capabilities are of the counterfeiters? It, yeah, it's a great question. I, we certainly want to understand the techniques that are being utilized. Um, as, as you know, if, if we're trying to review... 10,000 potential detections on a global market, how do you whittle those 10,000 down to the two or three or four that are actually infringing and to continually put human effort um, against that, you were really not playing the same game. So the combination of using wonderful technology for good and experts in the brands that they're representing is absolutely the the secret here and and I don't want to I don't want to say that we have all the answers right now because as you mentioned it is a very very uh, fast evolving um, marketplace and yeah even short form video uh, kind of embedding images within three seconds within a, a 15 second or 20 second or 30 second video how do you actually take that video and detect that uh, in order to then follow the trail for where that bad actor is and how they're feeding links to end consumers and trying to get people to purchase products um, that isn't authentic? So, yeah, so I think it is very much an arms race, but we have to do it. If, if we don't continually make the investments uh, to kind of use AI for good and, and keep the digital 
uh, world as authentic as we can. So we, we know that human nature, we're not going to be able to have 100% authenticity out there. Mm -hmm. It's just human nature. But I, I think that we have to stay up to speed with what the bad guys who are highly, highly funded and have access to some of the best technology that has ever hit the, the planet, we have to do better on our side. So. You know, you make a really good point, um, investment. And I think that's something that um, brands have to realize from the perspective that now continuing to invest in, in brand protection, whatever manner that takes, you, you really can't afford to lose a step in the brand, the brand protection process. You've, you've got to be in it, you've got to be involved, and you've got to be taking action. And whether it be time or money and a combination of both, but those things have to occur to be successful. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't agree more. I think that uh, over the past decade, let's say, uh, cyber security as an entire market, it's probably a trillion dollar market at this point, uh, but it really is focused on the actual assets of firms and protecting their firewalls, their cloud assets, their data from being encrypted and being held hostage and um, kind of external threats uh, like brand protection, which is most of the folks that together we go after on behalf of our, our shared customers, most of the folks that are the bad actors, they have no intention of ever trying to punch in and, and steal data or get things. They're only trying to stand up house of cards in order to do business and transact and then so, yeah, so I think that brand protection over the last 10, 15 years has been absolutely vital. And I think it's becoming more and more important as the sophistication for the bad guys gets better and better for them doing harm without ever getting inside of the four walls of, of our friends that we're protecting. Right. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, so let's talk a little bit about maybe the... You know, the platforms that are out there, again, uh, you, we're in the business of, of keeping the digital world safe. So we work as partnership with pretty much every major platform that's out there. But maybe just more some, some trends that we're seeing on some of the platforms related to the luxury goods market. What, what are some platforms that, that may keep you up at night, Angelo, as you're thinking about your customers? You know, there there are a lot of them. And I think... We, we take an approach where we look at which ones are people going to the most. If it's an obscure platform, well, then the attention will be a little bit less. We're not going to ignore it. We will look at it. We will monitor it. But we're, we're looking at places that are really hot right now. You know, Facebook Marketplace. We're looking at TikTok. Craigslist is, is still a thing. OfferUp is a thing. We are combating bots that do hundreds, uh, put up hundreds of sales offers on offer up on a regular basis. We're contending with uh, people who alter the way in which they uh, offer their product on TikTok. And, and to that end, um, we had great success early on uh, searching key terms. Now we have to search key audio terms mm. because the counterfeiters or the sellers have shifted from outright tagging their stuff with, hey, it's a counterfeit blank, to using a particularly popular song, using certain phraseology, and, and we're able to at least search. But going to back to the way we started this, it's constantly evolving. It's never the same battle. Yeah, it's, it's really a good point. It's kind of searching on text is kind of, Five years ago, ten years ago, if you can't search with images, if you can't search um, to to uh, you know decipher sound, um, it's getting harder and harder. Let's face it: the bad guys have the ability to take voice of famous people and say whatever they want, and it sounds exactly as if those people are saying it um, with the intonation and the and the accent and and, and whatnot. Uh, you know, celebrity kind of utilizing celebrities to represent counterfeits is easier and easier today than it has ever been. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, and maybe let's go a little bit into that. Cause I, I think, you know, in our prep, we talked a little bit about those songs, right? So, so what are, what are some trends that you're seeing there, uh, specifically to, to that, that, you know, we, we were in there monitoring every day. 
So we, we see things that certain people are doing. What we've noticed is there's more seasonality to counterfeits. It's something that if there's a, uh, a particular sporting event and it's not limited to, to the marquee, the, the Super Bowl or the, or the baseball playoffs or a World Series, but rather it can be any sporting event, the, the capacity of the counterfeiters to create um, particular products that are very niche when you look at them is amazing. Added to that, the ability to push this out on multiple platforms, they don't even need a website to be selling from. They're putting ads on the, on the platforms. They're posting to Instagram. That may take you to another place where they show their, their uh, full quantity of, and variety of merchandise. So I think that um, the, the, I guess it would be the adaptability of counterfeiters to, to do better in terms of offering product and um, knowing the trends that are out there and, and be able to uh, manipulate them in a way that gets them sales. And I'll, I'll just echo here a little bit, and I have to point out uh, your leadership and, and you know, your experience in this industry to really work with us to create a better platform, better product. Uh, we so appreciate that. So the, the flexibility that you're demanding from us in order to better support your customers, uh, the ability to change things, you know, within a calendar year to change where we're looking for things, how we're looking for things, uh, that's only making us a better software platform. So I, I, I just want to say point blank thank you uh, for that. Uh, so, so let's talk, you know, in, in most of the talks that we've had, talking about the success of a brand protection program, there, there's a number of ways to do it. How how would you say uh, you you've kind of worked with your customers to what is success of you know how you're supporting your customers? That's a great question. Let me let me just step back a little bit in terms of uh, how we we look for product and and how we we start how we how we create the building blocks to success. For us, it's important to be efficient. And what we find is that as the counterfeiters have gotten savvier and better at what they do, we've had to up the game. So that means that oftentimes we use software to assist our efforts, something that you mentioned earlier about the human component of the software, of the AI, and how to really hone it in. So we're involved that way. We want to be efficient to the point where we are getting the most takedowns on each platform for each customer. So for us, at the end of the day, we look at what's the platform? How important is it in the universe of exposure to potential clients, exposure to people who uh, are maybe interested in the brand, who are going to be one day customers? So we take that. And then we quantify the results. So at the end of the day, to us, being able to take down hundreds or thousands of listings is extremely important because our clients ask for reports on a regular basis. So we have to quantify for them, well, what did you do on TikTok? What did you do on Instagram, on Facebook, Facebook Marketplace? They break it all down. And as soon as we, they see the numbers, they know that they have a certain importance. Not everyone was going to be a customer for that particular brand or brands, but it's trying to tamp down the amount of counterfeits that are out there. So you can look at a financial figure and say, okay, 16,000 takedowns equals this value, but it's also in terms of how are we reducing counterfeit product that's there? How are we trying to block access to having people make mistake and order these dupes, these high-end counterfeits, which are not going to give them the same satisfaction as ordering genuine product? Right. What, what do you have similar? What, what are your metrics? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good question. Uh, some of our customers are, are kind of digital in, in nature, the way in which we can protect their um, monthly active users, uh, the interactions of folks on platforms, the integrity of 
uh, financial transactions. We have a number of uh, fintechs and, and large credit card companies that, that we support. Yeah, I think with luxury goods and with the, the physical product, certainly looking at the amount of takedown of of product that could be sold. And as you said, I, I think you're spot on. Uh, it's not a one-to-one -one match. So if you take down counterfeit product, does that mean that all that revenue immediately goes over to the brand? Maybe not, but it certainly does um, provide an opportunity for the marketing programs, for the, the selling of the actual authentic product to have a better footprint to get to the people who want access to that brand. Um, in the gaming world, certainly we have, uh, you know, kind of mobile app store, mobile apps that we're taking down that have thousands of paying customers each month that want to interact with a brand and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of making, taking that away gives an opportunity for the brand itself to better monetize uh, their intellectual property and their assets and their investment in that brand. So, yeah, there's there's a number of different ways. I appreciate the question back. It, and one thing I will say, even in just the couple of years that I've been here at Tracer, the last six months alone, we have seen a dramatic increase in our customers across the board really wanting to start to articulate the value because I think at the C-suite levels and the boardroom, brand protection is starting to finally get the attention that it deserves. So I think explaining the value uh, to you know what, what a brand protection program could be uh, is really, really important. No, you're right. In fact, I, you reminded me of one thing. We, we, when we search for apps, some of our clients don't produce apps or, or downloadable components that are part of apps. Yet it is a focus because you, you really have to sometimes go beyond the normal markets, the normal places where you would find the product or products associated with the brand. And I think it's important just to mention to, to people who are protecting the brands to just don't think of it as we're selling an X. No, it's, it's X plus, And that's where you have to do the enforcement as well. 100%. 100%. So let's uh, jump into the fun section of our Tracer talk. We're going to have a little bit of fun, rapid fire questions here, Angelos. Uh, no pressure, but whatever comes to mind. Okay. What would you okay. choose to eat for your last meal? Okay. So last meal, because, you know, this, there's going to be a bit of an Italian play in here. So I would have Parmigiano Reggiano cheese, vacche rosse from the traditional old cows. At least three years old, I would pair that with some prosciutto or mortadella in a rosetta panino, which is a particular roll that is very airy inside and allows you to stuff it with things. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm hungry. So uh, what superpower would you choose? Uh, is there a superpower to eliminate counterfeit goods? Because I want it. <laughs> That's, yeah. It's working with Tracer. Uh, okay. There you go. Uh, what's your most productive part of the day? Early morning. Love getting into the office at like seven. And then you have these few hours where nobody's around and it just sets the tone for the day and allows you to accomplish a lot of things. Couldn't agree more. Cats or dogs? Parakeets. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm a I, love I love it. I love it. <laughs> Good choice. An espresso from either uh, Tazza d'Oro in Rome or Illy Brand. Favorite genre of music? Um, because I used to have an Italian language radio show back in my law school and college days. I'm going to say Italian cantautori as well as ballads and Italian pop. Favorite pizza? Margarita with arugula. Most prized possession. I would have to say anything like photos or mementos tied to family. Good one. Going back years and years. Good one. Uh, and best advice you've ever received. All right. Best advice. This one I have to read and explain. And I think you know where this is going to go. <laughs> so best, this comes from a quote from the Princess Bride. All right. The greatest that movie of all time. Movie. Okay. So good night, Wesley. Good work. Sleep well. I'll most likely kill you in the morning. So that is advice because it tells you to do your best every day, every time, because you're going to be judged on the last thing that you did, the last day you worked for a client. You know, you always have to make sure that if that's your last day, it is your best. Love it. Angelo, you have been absolutely fantastic. 
Thank you for your partnership. Thank you for your vision. vision. It is wonderful to work with you. Can't say enough uh, how much I appreciate our relationship. Yeah, thanks, everyone. That was episode five, Brand Protection with AI, Fighting Cybercrime in the Luxury Goods Market. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Tracer Talks. To see more content on brands and digital risk protection, visit our website, tracer.ai.